Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College Cambridge saying this on one of the picks. Kevin Walsh's professional career and writings would make him a strong presidential choice for Treasury and for the Federal Reserve. Mohammed joins us now for more. Mohammed, are you endorsing a candidate then in this race for Treasury? What I'm saying, John, of the four, the one that I have followed most closely is Kevin Walsh. I've done that for almost two decades. And if you look at what he would bring to either or both jobs, um, first, a good understanding and knowledge of economics. You're talking about Stanford, Harvard, MIT. He would bring policymaking experience, the NEC and the Fed. He would bring private sector experience. He understands the functioning of the capital markets. It's not often that you find someone who can operate at this intersection of economics, finance, and policy. And it's not often that you find someone who not only can operate there, but can communicate well. And we do need much better economic communication. Mohammed, I've said this a few times, and I'm sure you'd agree. It's good news that the caliber of all the candidates is so high, given the challenges they'll have to confront in the next several years. As we look ahead to 2025, could we go through a few of those challenges right now? What do you think the biggest are for the incoming Treasury Secretary? I think it's maintain economic growth. John, I can't stress how important that is. Um, It is important to deal with problems of inequality. It's important to deal with the debt issue. The best way to address a debt issue is through economic growth. And we are looking at a major transition, which is ongoing, from old engines of growth to new engines, or what economists call the old model of growth to the new model of growth. And the Treasury Secretary will be the lead person in figuring how we navigate all this. Mohammed, if it is someone like Kevin Warsh and everyone knows his end game is the Fed, does that blur the line of Fed independence? I think you summed it well that that line has been blurred before. But I suspect that if Walsh gets the job, he's going to be really careful as to what he says on monetary policy. He will respect that line. Um, It's also not clear that the president-elect will commit to a second step for Kevin Walsh. Um, I suspect that he will say he will keep his options open. So I don't worry about that, Anne-Marie. I just look at Kevin as someone who, both as Treasury and Fed Chair, I think would do a really good job. If this drags on, we weren't supposed to get a pick yesterday, if we don't get one today, if this continues to drag drag on, Gary Cohn reminded us all yesterday that his pick, his nod, and also Mnuchin's nod came after Thanksgiving. Is that in itself a market negative, given the fact that we have all these other nominees floating around for the incoming administration, but we don't have this one key name for the markets? Yeah, I thought Gary's interview with you yesterday was really good because he said two things. One, as you, as you just mentioned, he said, look, I didn't find out a lot of Thanksgiving. Um, and then the second thing he said is look at what we inherited then, including some unanticipated development compared to what the new team will have been inheriting now. So I don't think it's a market negative. I particularly don't think it's a market negative because, as John said, there are credible candidates being um, considered. Oh, it's so we told. So, no, I don't think it is a market negative. I think it's the right thing to take time to make this decision. Mohammed, I thought of you a lot this morning when I saw the flows for the past week into bonds and stock funds in the U.S., and I saw the outflows, the dramatic outflows from European bond and stock flows, and I thought about your comment about that sucking sound of capital away from the rest of the world and into the United States, and I have to wonder, are there limits to this? Because basically, the fact that everybody else's pain is leading to the U.S. gain is also leading to higher rates that the rest of the world is going to pay for. In other words, they're going to pay for that debt because of the attraction of interest rates. When does that kind of balance out? Do people get sick of this story? 
Not for a while. And I thought of all three of you because I remember when, when we were together last week and we talked about the global economy and I told you the good, the bad and the ugly and I put Europe in the ugly, saying there really is an issue there that as both secular and cyclical headwinds come together. And today's PMI numbers are a clear reminder that there is this problem and it's getting deeper. We know what the solutions are. There is the Draghi report, but there is no political will to implement it. So the U.S. will continue to diverge. Like you, Lisa, I think divergence is a really important um, theme for the next 12 months. Is there a limit? Sure, there's a limit at some point, but we're not there yet. And the worst thing is to sacrifice U.S. growth in order to get lower rates. That would be the worst. I mean, the U.S. is the only engine of global growth right now. So you do not want to sacrifice the only engine of, of global growth. What you do want to happen is both for China and for Europe to get the act together and to transition to healthier and higher growth. I have to wonder also how much this pushes central banks around the world to keep investing in gold and try to diversify away from the dollar because at some point there has to be some anger or at least a feeling of frustration that everybody else is at the whims of the United States in terms of whatever kind of uh, fiscal situation they want to implement and that the fiscal dominance allows them to do that. How much do you see that kind of trend in gold in other asset classes really continuing as people look toward a day that maybe could be a different regime with respect to the dollar. So, so this trend, which we have seen now for a solid 12 months of trying to diverse away from both the dollar as a, as a reserve currency and importantly, looking to diverse away from the dollar system as a payment system. And I worry much more about the second than the first. Um, the trend is there. And for the reasons you've cited, on, on the currency side, at the margin, and I want to stress it is at the margin, people are looking to diverse away, away from the dollar into gold. The payment system is a reaction to the worry about weaponization of investment sanctions and trade. So, so that is ongoing. And we have to keep an eye on it. Now, we're not anywhere near critical mass. There is nothing to replace the dollar at the center of the system. There is nothing to replace the dollar payment system. However, you don't want alternatives as clunky and as inefficient as they are to gain momentum. Which is why we're seeing the dollar depreciate against gold, depreciate against something like Bitcoin. But I think we have to take a step back and recognize what it's not doing against other currencies. We're facing the prospect of an eight consecutive week of strength for the US dollar, for dollar index, for DXY. Mohammed, the why is because the data in America has been pretty decent and we're rethinking the Fed's path. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank had this to say in his outlook. Growth is too fast. Inflation is too furious for Fed cuts. Our baseline sees a 25 basis point cut in December, calls it a close call, goes on to say after that we expect an extended pause which keeps the Fed funds rate above 4% into 2026. Is that your base case too? So my base case is they cut by 25. When they come to their next meeting, they'll have clarity on three things that will impact how they see the economy going. They'll have clarity on tariffs. They'll have clarity on immigration. And they'll have clarity on where the budget is going. And they'll, get, they'll build up that clarity as they go into the year. And that is what's going to determine whether they do more or not. They're going to want to, going to see how these three things. John, these fundamentally impact. First, tariffs will, will impact price behavior. You see this in the UK. Companies now have gotten much more used to passing on any increased costs. So in the case of the UK, the, the supermarkets have come out and said, you know what, the higher national insurance contributions, we're going to pass on that to prices. And demand here is not as strong in the US as it is in the US. So tariffs will have an impact on pricing behavior by companies. Immigration will have impact on the labor market. And of course, what they decide on taxes in particular, which will come ahead of what they do on spending, where they're looking to cut spending, will have an impact on issuance. So they're going to ha the Fed is going to have to step back and look at these three things and yep. then decide how they fit into this big puzzle. Let's finish on that word clarity. They'll have clarity on tariffs. They might have clarity on what the approach might be, how big the tariffs will be. They may not have clarity on the effects. And this is something you touched on earlier this week when you talked about things like trade flows, 
corporate pricing, demand supply elasticities. How long does it take to get clarity on the effect of those tariffs? Yeah, and that list goes on, John. Game theoretics, statecraft. I mean, it is a very complex issue, and the media has tended to simplify it, um, oversimplify it. No, they'll need time, but they'll have a clarity on how serious is the direction of travel. And that's going to be important in how they think about what interest, what policy rate should do. Mohammed, we appreciate your time. We're lucky to catch up with you, sir. Thank you. Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge, on the latest in the United States and beyond. Trade is ramping up bets on a jumbo rate cut in December by the ECB as Eurozone PMIs contracted in November, feeling concerns about the state of Europe's economy as it faces down the prospect of higher tariffs from the incoming Trump administration. Joining us now is a man who has a say at next month's meeting, the Portuguese Central Bank Governor Mario Santino. Governor Santino, thank you for being with us, sir. We appreciate your time. It's important to point out that every official on the Governing Council has a different view. And at a time this morning where people are questioning whether the ECB is behind the curve, I think it's important to highlight your more recent comments suggest you are very much ahead of this weaker data anticipating it and worried about it we'd love your reaction to this morning's economic data and whether you believe a 50 basis point rate cut should be on the table at next month's meeting well thank you for having me uh, and good morning from london well, we um, have to take this data uh, in, in the context of all the information that we now uh, have uh, to, to, to take a decision next month. We will have also new forecasts. Uh, my first reaction is that this um, data uh, certainly confirms uh, the appropriateness of the, of the decision we, we took in uh, October and the profile that uh, we now have for the trajectory of uh, interest rates uh, also going forward. This is uh, the appropriate message that uh, I'd like to send. We know, uh, I mean, the challenges ahead. We know that the euro area economy is struggling to recovery. Uh, the most important, though, is that inflation is on target. Uh, and we need to move uh, according to all these uh, data. Uh, the, 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 today's uh, information uh, goes along uh, the, the way, indeed, uh, I I have been uh, looking at the, the, the European economy. Uh, it just uh, confirms that that, uh, that that we need to move with monetary policy. Governor, how quickly you move is part of the conversation, and whether you should be constrained by 25 basis point increments or not. Do you believe larger reductions should be considered in a month from now? Well, we, we have been discussing that for a while. Uh, I rather uh, prefer us to move gradual, uh, and gradual means steady uh, and uh, with predictable uh, steps. Uh, but, uh, of course, if, uh, if the data uh, confirms that um, uh, the risks uh, to the downside uh, in, in growth materialize, uh, that the, the numbers for inflation that we still uh, are expecting these months uh, go in the same direction, uh, we, we, we can uh, certainly discuss and be open to discuss uh, different steps. But um, what is more important is to send a, a message uh, of uh, we are doing our job, uh, we are moving interest rates in the right direction and we will continue to do so uh, as long as data requires. As you know and from listening to you and your colleagues the focus so far has been on normalizing interest rates which speaks to that gradual approach. Governor when I look at the data out of Europe when we all do when we see Germany barely growing and the PMI is in contraction I think quite rightly the conversation is changing in financial markets to whether you need to be accommodative whether we should be constrained by this idea of normalizing and moving in gradual steps or whether we should be open to becoming accommodative and moving much more quickly. What's the difference between yeah. the two for you? <laughs> We, we do know that we are still uh, in restrictive uh, territory. Uh, the interest rate is above uh, the neutral levels, uh, and, and, and so this means that uh, the, the path uh, going forward will be to continue to, to, to reduce uh, the, the level of interest rates. 
We also know that the biggest problem in Europe is investment, uh, and uh, investment is certainly quite sensitive to the interest rate, so uh, it uh, will be also of importance for us uh, to, to have the support of the economy so that inflation can remain at 2%. We don't want to go below 2%, uh, and for that we need a stronger economy. So it's the combination of those two uh, that, that need to uh, be uh, on the table uh, so that we take um, uh, a decision that so far brought us in a stable path, which is always important, to 2 percent, and, and, and now we need to make sure that we continue there. Governor, if I could put you on the spot, a pointed question. Do you believe the biggest risk right now is above target inflation or below target inflation? And I'm not talking about next month's data. I'm thinking about a medium-term view. Looking out several years, what is the biggest risk, above target inflation or below target inflation? Well, the history of Europe in the 10 years prior to this inflationary experience was uh, below target inflation. And the fundamentals for the European economy didn't change much. So, in my view, we need to be uh, concerned with below target inflation, the risks that we face today, uh, both from the economy and from shocks uh, outside Europe, take us uh, in that direction. So we need to focus on not going below target uh, uh, in, in terms of the medium term, because then uh, we open up again the, the issue of, as you are saying, normalizing monetary policy. Uh, we were uh, successful thus far to, to, to bring inflation to 2%. Now the job is a little bit different. Uh, it's like, you know, this last mile not being uh, a, a pass from above the target but from below the target and and it's not easy uh, it proved not easy for the eurozone to uh, bring inflation close to two percent before 2019 uh, and we need to be very serious about it how much do you think that on a broader sense the ecb needs to consider i don't want to say a dual mandate like the federal reserve where you're looking at employment as well as inflation but the growth backdrop as well as maybe there's going to be that bumpiness that you talk about in the near-term path of inflation, but the longer-term path, you see that risk as significantly to the downside when it comes to that disinflation. Well, I don't think we need to discuss the dual mandate or the single mandate that we have. We just need to remind ourselves that inflation is, uh, is an endogenous variable. Uh, it is uh, strictly connected with uh, the way the economy goes. Uh, by targeting inflation, we are somehow looking at a broader uh, set of data uh, and, and see how it interacts with prices. Uh, the labor market, uh, certainly, unemployment, employment, the the dynamism that the European economy had recently on the labor market is very important and it's, it's also our job to protect it, to preserve it. Uh, that's not because of the labor market on its own, which is already important, but it's on the impact that this may have uh, on inflation. We do know that an economy that's, that doesn't grow, that doesn't invest, will not uh, be compatible with prices at 2%. So I, I always look at this uh, in a more broad sense. Uh, so for me, uh, yeah. honestly, the, the thing of the dual mandate is not an issue. Governor, you brought up shocks from outside of Europe. I'd like to talk about those shocks with you. The prospect of a change of policy in the United States. United States following the US election and whether that introduces a new risk that you have to confront. If the walls go up, if the tariffs go up in America, and we're all concerned about overcapacity in China, there's one place that's going to have to eat that overcapacity, and it could be another disinflationary threat. That's Europe. Yeah. Can you walk me through your understanding of the policy changes we might see in the next year and the kind of risk it introduces to your outlook? I totally agree with you uh, on, on the way you put the, the risks that the tariffs and the, the spare capacity that we see around the globe uh, will imply to, to inflation. So I see these shocks uh, from an economic policy uh, perspective as a wake-up call for Europe. Uh, 
uh, Europe needs to move from the passenger seat that very often uh, we see Europe uh, sitting comfortable to a, a more leading uh, role uh, in the world. That will call for a, a, an increased role for the euro internationally. We were discussing that back in 2019, just prior to COVID. Uh, we may be facing the same challenges uh, right now, uh, so we better uh, focus on the response that Europe needs to, to do uh, and to produce to those uh, challenges instead of discussing what is going on uh, elsewhere. We do uh, know that um, we need to move very fast uh, if, if we are presented with these challenges. If I, if I may, uh, I, um, I, I, can, I can quote here uh, Elvis Presley uh, and say to you that uh, we can't go on together if uh, those challenges from the outside um, uh, present to Europe challenges that Europe cannot, uh, cannot go along with. So uh, for the past couple of months, the ECB terminal rate is expected to be something like 2.5% by the end of next year. Putting Elvis Presley aside, given all of the potential external shocks and the current trajectory, do you think it ought to be much lower than that? Well, uh, I, I don't see reasons for uh, the ne neutral rate in Europe to be much different from uh, before this crisis. Uh, the fundamentals in Europe are pretty similar. We have a more dynamic labor market that will certainly help bringing the natural rate uh, up, but uh, probably it will not be enough given um, the, oh, m many other factors like demography and productivity activity that will still wait uh, in, into, into, into that number. So uh, if we go close to 2%, probably below, uh, it will be my best uh, guess uh, right now for, for the, the, the neutral to be. Uh, so we still have some uh, way, some paths to cover, uh, and, and, and we, need, we need to be very much focused on that. Interesting. Sir, we appreciate your time. With a suspicious mind, ECB Governing Council member Mario Santino. Thank you, sir. Let's stick with retail. One week out from Black Friday and a shortened holiday shopping season. Gap and Walmart seeing higher-end consumers coming to them for value as Target sees weakening sales and inventory piling up. Joining us now is Dana Talsi of Talsi Advisory Group. Dana, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Compare Target to everybody else. What went wrong there? 48% of Target sales are discretionary. They had elevated promotions, higher costs, didn't work. You look at Walmart, which has 60% of their sales coming from essentials. And when you think about discretionary, look what you just mentioned. The gap is gaining some momentum right now. Look at TJX, same thing. They're gaining some momentum too. So that value shopper where there is style and product is working. Is there an execution story there as well? What is the gap doing it, right? I think a couple things. I mean, Richard's, f Richard's um, phrase, is perform while you transform. But one of the things they're doing right is the consistency of looking at the product and really elevating it today's times. Look at the wide leg denim jeans. They are remodeling some of their stores. At Old Navy, the kids' business is important. And the kids' business weakened in this quarter given the weather that was out there. Coming out of the quarter, kids strengthened. And so I think off price value and where there's newness and innovation, Consumers are going. So you have that in what's happening with the Gap brand and at Old Navy. I want to get into policy and all of that, but what is newness and innovation right now? We talk about this. Is it launches? Is it limited edition? Is it wide leg pants that are going to be in style for you know another six months, maybe? No, typically denim cycles can be three years. Oh, okay. so they can be Sorry, a I take longer. it back. No, no worries. <laughs> but when you think about innovation, what's new and different? What about the closed-toed shoes at Birkenstock? Selling at full price, people People are buying the sandals and they're buying the closed-toed shoes. When you think about the wide leg jeans, there's a lot in footwear. Look what Hoka's doing. With the new colorways at Hoka, it's interesting. Same thing at On. But you know what? You marry the product with the physical space. Look at the new remodels that are opening. If you walk lower Fifth Avenue, the new Gap remodel, it's colors, it's got punch. You take a look at the Abercrombie middle, mi remodel, the expanded the men's area. Look at the new On Store. So we've got newness in product, newness in channel, and you need to have value. 
Maybe Target just needs a new dog and then they'll be just fine. But there There's is work question. to be done. Okay. <laughs> but meanwhile, it's more you than do... just the dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably more than just the dog, given some of the performance. But there is this question about how exposed some of these retailers are to the potential of tariffs, mm -hmm. especially if their whole rebirth depends on the ability for fast goods that yes. they can get manufactured yes. and brought in. When we had tariffs the first time, everyone went to diversify their sourcing out of China. It's happening again now. Probably the one who's talked about it the most is Steve Madden, taking their percentage of goods from China down from 50% to 25%, hopefully in almost a year. Gap said it on their call last night, around less than 10% of their goods come from China. Where else are people going? They're going to Mexico, they're going to Africa, they're going to Vietnam in terms of where goods are going to be. The end result, though, and National Retail Federation talked about it, if we have these tariffs, you're going to have an impact to consumer spending that can approach nearly $80 billion. And what it requires in the apparel area, if you're going to have increased costs passed on to the consumer, can be price increases of low double digits. That's a concern across the board. Are any of these retailers talking about coming back to the United States? Because what President-elect Trump is talking about is a the, basically a mm -hmm. carrot and stick approach. I'm putting up the walls, but you're going to get a 15% potentially corporate tax rate if you produce in USA. Now, we, they, some of them have mentioned some items coming back to the USA, but basically it's Mexico, it's Vietnam, it's even Africa where people are going. The labor costs are lower, they have the labor to be able to make the goods and the expertise of it. That's why the reason why everyone's in China, there is no China like China in terms of the expertise of how they make the goods. It will be a problem and a big topic of discussion throughout 25 if those tariffs get enacted. Tariffs is one potential risk down the pipe. We also mm -hmm. have the ports, yep. that strikers. That deadline is January 15th. We see Target overshoot when they were building their inventory. Do you see retailers now having to build up inventory because they're concerned there won't be a deal in January? I think overall they're watching carefully. Only Target has been the one who's called out the increased inventory that they're building. I don't really have others. As the earnings are being reported, you're still seeing inventory growth less than sales growth. Tuesday's a major day. You have all the mall retailers reporting on Tuesday in addition to Burlington. You got 10 reports coming out on Tuesday. We'll hear more, but what we've heard so far, I'm not seeing inventory pileups except for Target calling it out. Why did they get it so wrong then? Mm -hmm. The target? Yeah, how did they step on such a massive inventory landmine? Different way of looking at things and how, they're, and how they're planning than everyone else. It is surprising in terms of how they stood out so much. Because when you look at Walmart, who reported just the day before, it was the other areas of business that also accelerated the growth. When the numbers dropped, I think we all reflected on the same thing. It reminded us of spring 2022. Mm -hmm. This isn't the first time we've seen this movie, no. which I think is why some investors were pretty spooked by it. It's as if they haven't corrected for the mistakes they made a couple of years back. Is that a fair criticism of them I, or is that unfair? I think overall they may have corrected then for the mistakes they made, but then looking at the macro landscape, they acted faster and took ch made change quicker than others, while others basically are saying it takes time to enact some of these initiatives. And so, no, I'm not seeing others do that. So you think they overcorrected yes. corrected based on the lesson that they learned in 22? Yeah. It seems like it's way too advanced for what compared to everybody else. And you have to look at this holiday season. With a compressed season of five fewer days, promotions are happening. I don't know about your email inbox, but mine Full. is filled with Out 8 of percentage off. How much does that five days change things? Huge. I think the five days is very important. It makes the Black Friday weekend that much more important because there are fewer days. People over we still shop the last 10 days before Christmas, but it's going to make the retailers hit the dial on let's ante up the promotions. I wonder if Target is sort of a warning shot in terms of competing on more the innovation and less on just price. Value has to also come with something new. And I wonder how much Walmart is exerting that pressure because they can compete in a way that nobody else can because of their product mix. Is that the takeaway from some of the recent earnings? Well, part of it, but also look what Walmart's doing. What du when Doug McMillan said that their highest growth came from some of their upper income consumers, of $100,000 household income, they're taking that share from the targets of the world. And you also have to say, look at the growth of TJX, the traffic increases that TJ is getting. And frankly, even some of the luxury items that they have, they're smattered about in just select stores, but it's a driver. Well, is Gap, Gap basically copying that? Because they said yesterday that they're also making inroads with 
upper middle class wealthy mm -hmm. patrons. But part of what Gap is doing Look at the collaborations to your mention before, whether it's influencers, whether it's Cult Gaia, they're getting in the conversation by stepping up and saying, we're part of the brand halo that's out there of other brands who want to be and reach a wider audience of consumers that have a wider income level. Top pick this holiday shopping season. What is it? Oh, I think, well, I think on value, I think it's going to be TJX. That's the top pick there. Okay. When I think about newness, I think Birkenstock is going to continue to drive sales. I can't stand them. You're I don't know. Me. I'm looking at the clogs now. I'm them, not too them and sure. Crocs. I just, I just cannot get on board I with like, that. I like uh, Do you? Birkenstocks. Yeah, yeah. Do you? I do. tracks very much so. And like, yeah, tables. Doing your taxes in Birkenstocks? Totally. Absolutely. Okay. That's me. All right. Yep. <laughs> I, I will out myself on that. I actually do think, I think they're very convenient. How many convenient. do you own? I only own one. With socks, because okay. people wear them with that, socks. That's I, weird. I think it's so specific, and it's such an era. I think it lasted less than three years, so the people who oh, do it now. that's done. I think that is, that is so that done. That has a three-year cycle, too. <laughs> that has about a two-month cycle. That is a no cycle. Dana, I appreciate your time. It's good to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Busy few weeks of shopping ahead of us. Dana Towsey there of Towsey Advisory Group. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.